Ali und Amo Khaldar. Jeder ist kreativ. Todos somos creativos. Everyone is creative. Eine Vie kreative exige Bravour et Accept. Ali Hag. Ohor, Job. We are here to support you. Se celebrum. Alotur de Tila. E invitarte a hacer las cosas que amas. No, the Kudrat Jam Bobadan. We believe in giving a damn. Women sing sing in the face of each other. In aprender de los demás. In hugs and high fives. Unimos pessoas que são movidas por paixão e propósito. Para que eles aspirem mutuamente. In nachbarschaften und Städten auf der ganzen Welt werden. Todos son bienvenidos. Alla e welcome. Qual de luna? Este bienvenido. Women hugging, make a Tout le monde est le bienvenu. Everyone, everyone is welcome. at least one or two uh, languages. So it was made by all our chapters and it just wanna show you that everyone is welcome, everyone is creative, no matter where you're coming from, what's your skin color, your religion, we are all human beings and uh, yeah, we are facing these days the same challenges uh, and uh, yeah, and with this uh, travel, journey every tuesday i want to present countries uh, yeah by locals and uh, hear their special stories and their experience and today i just want to travel with you with maria and maybe maria can tell a little bit about herself hi maria <laughs> yeah sure hi everyone nice to see you all here um i am maria i'm from romania born and raised in bucharest and right now I live in Cologne, but I'm an expat. I've been an expat for the past eight years. So I've been changing countries and living and traveling in different places. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about myself with the presentation. Should I um, already start, Nadia? Should I share my screen? Yes, feel free right. to share your screen. Perfect. To create me on a, a bigger scale and so when i was in the future i think i'm adopting some of these things funding them so there we go everyone is muted <laughs> all right so uh again so disclaimer everything that i say is probably subjective because it comes from me so it's my view of things in of romania and if you have a different view then i that's absolutely okay. I think we have some time um, at the end to also discuss or to take any questions. Again, like Nadim said, if you have any suggestions or questions or ideas, feel free to write them in the chat box and then Nadine would ask me questions and, and we can absolutely discuss. Um, all right, so first of all, a little bit about myself uh, and who I am. Um, so like I mentioned, I've been quite international over the past eight years. I first moved, moved for studies with uh, something called Erasmus. I think a lot of you know that already. Um, it's a European scholarship um, and I lived in the UK for a year. Then I, I moved to Amsterdam where I did my master's. And then I also worked there with startups. Uh, after that, I moved to Berlin where again, I worked with startups for about three years. Um, after that, I took a sabbatical. So for one year, I traveled around the world and traveling has always been a, a very big passion of mine. Um, and now I'm just freshly back from, from the trip. Luckily, it was before the whole COVID madness. Um, I, I was very lucky to be able to do that. And now I have settled in Cologne since January. So. Um, I started a, a new role um, and uh, yeah, moved to a new city that I'm, I'm still trying to, to explore and discover. Um, my biggest passion probably in, in life is food. Uh, I am really passionate about um, discovering different cultures through food. So, you know, with every country that I traveled um, to, I tried to cook with locals and stay their place and try to, you know, understand how uh, food impacts their culture. And then I am also a businesswoman and I've spent my career in um, 
digital innovation fields, working with startups and corporations, particularly around building new uh, markets and, um, and creating new digital products. So that's me in a nutshell. Uh, enough about that. I'll get on with the topic that you all care about. Um, so for the past eight years, I have interacted with people from all over the world. And when they ask me where I'm from and I say Romania, these are some of the reactions that I get. Um, so the size of the bubble essentially kind of signifies how often I hear that word. So most often people uh, mention Dracula, which I mean, it's, it's kind of fun, right? Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later and what's true and what's a myth. Um, I hear gypsies a lot and we'll touch upon that today a little bit as well. People ask me if it's a safe place, so, so we can discuss that um, too. Um, and then very few mention Budapest as the capital, which, which it's not. Uh, the capital of Romania is Bucharest. And then some small proportion know about our famous gymnast, Nadia Comaneci. So I think this is kind of what I, what I usually get. Uh, so I thought, okay, let's discuss some of these things, but also some others maybe that are less popular and that might give you a new insight into what Romania is. So these are all some pictures that I thought are very representative of Romania. Um, if there's one thing, if you, if you ask me to, to kind of summarize Romania in one word, I would say that Romanians love celebrations and family and traditions. Um, and if you ever go there, I think you would Feel like a king a little bit um, just because not only do we love um, tr you know outsiders and travelers but also we very much uh, love guests so if you visit someone's house the first thing they would do is they they would give you something to eat and something to drink and i know many countries around the world are equally as um, hospitable but yeah romania is very known for how well they feed you when you visit um, and then another bit here, you might see the, the liquor here, the artisanal liquor. It's something that is also very famous around Romania. It's called suica. It's very similar to schnapps or uh, palinka. You have different versions of this around the world. Um, and it's essentially a liquor that people make at home in their backyard. It's made from plums. And um, people think that it's medicinal, and particularly in the rural areas, they would start with a with a glass of tuica. Some of them even early in the morning, and continue until the the, the day ends. So again, not always, of course. You know, I don't want you to think that everyone in Romania is drunk. It's far from it. Uh, but yeah, particularly in the rural areas, I think it's very much a part of people's lives. Um, and then we also, a fun fact, we love giving gifts and receiving gifts. So this was always a, a bit of a shock when I interacted and moved to different other countries and different cultures. Uh, so in Romania, we give gifts for name days and for many other occasions. And right before our call, I tried to count how many times I receive presents in a year from my friends and family. And I thought of 10 right on top of my head. Um, so, you know, it might be more, I don't even know, but essentially, I don't know if it explains why Romania is poor because they spend all their money on gifts, <laughs> probably not. Um, but yeah, we, we really love celebrating and kind of getting together and um, yeah, gifts in general. Even sometimes if you would go to someone's place to visit, you would bring something as a token of appreciation. All right, so I just thought because Romania is not a country that a lot of people know much about to give you a short overview. So this is how it looks like. You see in the right upper corner, it looks kind of like a fish. Uh, we have access to the Black Sea. We have mountains in the center. We have the Danube, uh, this big river in Europe. So for, for the ones of you who are not in there, um, that constitutes the Southern border, border of the country and Romania is located in the Eastern Europe um, area. We have a little bit under 20 million people. 
And if you look at Romanians, you know, you, you wouldn't say that they all uh, look the same. And I think it's part of our diversity and many influences that we've had. So you would have people who are lighter skin, darker skin, lighter eyes, darker eyes. So it's quite a diverse group of people. Um, in the past, because of its unique strategic position, so access to the sea, the, the, you know, the Danube in the south, which would allow for infrastructure and transport, and the mountains in the center who would act as a natural barrier. Romania presented a lot of interest to different powers of the world because it would constitute as a good, let's say, location in different wars and different uh, times and empires. Um, so we were pretty much conquered by everyone. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people. So the Dacians were, were there, then the Roman Empire um, was there. I think it was one of the last stops of the Roman Empire. Um, and we were also very Latinized because of that. Uh, Hungarians, Germans, the Ottoman Empire. We have also French in influences. Um, the language is the most uh, Latin language there is, actually. So the, the Romans had quite a strong impact. They settled for a while in Romania. Um, and um, I think around 60% of our words have Latin origin. So just to give you a quick example, um, uh, hello would be Buna ziua, which is very similar to um, Buenos dias, uh, bon dia, or other um, you know, Latin ways of saying um, this, so in Spanish or in, in Portuguese. Um, during the World War II, we um, fell under the Soviet Union uh, and we uh, were under communism until 89, uh, when the revolution happened. And I'll talk to you a bit about that. But I think these, all of the, you know, the diverse background uh, and influences plus the communist period have shaped who Romania is today quite a lot. Um, and for anyone who's wondering, we joined also, we're part of the European Union since 2007. All right. And can I ask you uh, what language uh, languages do you learn in school? So, all right, that's an interesting question. So obviously the language in Romania is Romanian. Um, we learn English and I would say particularly the younger population uh, speaks good English. And uh, also the movies are not dubbed. Yeah, so we learn quite, quite fast. Uh, and then German uh, is, and French are the most common ones to learn in school. Okay. Some schools have other languages as well. Spanish would be one, but most common are, are German and French. Okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, because your English is perfect, so yeah. <laughs> I can well, imagine I that. Uh, for a while, but I still have an accent, but I mean, yeah. We all have. <laughs> Even the all English right. people have so, an accent. <laughs> let's address Dracula for a second, because I know probably a lot of you were thinking about it when you joined this call about Romania. So, um, unfortunately, it's a myth. There are no vampires that anyone knows of in Romania. It all started with Bram Stoker's book, and he based the character of Dracula um, on Vlad Tsepes. So this was a, a Romanian ruler, and he earned his uh, nickname of Vlad the Impaler. And um, he, in the 17th uh, century, or no, 15th, I, I, it's a typo here. In the 15th century, um, Vlad the Impaler went to war with what was at the time the most powerful empire, the Ottoman Empire. Um, and he, his area was quite, quite small compared to the empire, but he was known for being very bloody and very um, cruel. So he had a very low tolerance towards thieves and well, pretty much everything else. Um, and he would punish people by impaling them. Um, so it is estimated that uh, he impaled between 40,000 and 100 people um, when he was attacked by, by the, um, the Sultan's army. Uh, and he created the forest of the impaled that frightened the Sultan so much that he retreated all the way back to Constantinople. So that's where the story of Dracula comes from. Unfortunately, 
he was not a vampire, although uh, perhaps his thirst for, for blood and a uh, very visceral way of killing people might have inspired that story. But uh, Transylvania is a real place and it's, it, it is in Romania and it is in this area where, uh, where Vlad Tepes um, ruled. And for the ones of you who expect that the Dracula castle is something very gothic and very dark, I'm very sorry to disappoint you, but this is how it looked like. It was actually the summer residence of a princess. Um, so if you do go to Romania and you do visit the, the Bran Castle, I think by now, because of tourism and everything, you'll hear a lot of the stories that people would, you know, sell all, all sorts of souvenirs with Dracula, but it is still the, the castle where this um, nice princess here lived uh, during summers. All right. So I'll touch upon a bit of a darker topic now, and I promise it will lighten up towards the end of, of my presentation. Um, as, you, as I mentioned before, and as you might have already known, Romania was under communism for quite a while. Um, and I just thought it might be interested to, interesting to give you a flavor of what life during communism was. So I was born after communism fell, but um, I think in Romania, you hear a lot of stories from your parents and your grandparents. Um, essentially, there were, you were not allowed any contact with the exterior. So censorship, um, there was no free speech. You were not allowed to study, for example, um, you know, different languages, you had to study uh, Russian, you, had, you, you were not to, allowed to read certain books. Um, a lot of the um, intellectual uh, writers and, and artists in Romania who tried at the time to write about it or to, to write things that did not agree uh, with Nicolae Ceausescu, who was the ruler, were imprisoned. Um, and you also often had to mind what you say even around, uh, around friends and colleagues because you could get imprisoned if you said the wrong, the wrong thing to the wrong person. Um, yeah, like I said, no outside influ uh, influences and just to kind of bring it into perspective, people didn't know, did, didn't have access to proper coffee, they didn't have access to Coca-Cola, which at the time was really big around the world, um, to jeans and really very simple things. Um, and then they were queuing for food, so people had ratios, so you were allowed each week a certain amount of oil and a certain amount of bread and a certain amount of gas for, for, for um, gasoline for cars, uh, but still people would queue. And here in the picture on the bottom right, you have, you know, families would send their elderly and their children to queue for hours so that they could buy bread and other things because of the scarcity so people would bring their chairs and kind of sit there for four five six hours and wait to buy their bread um and also you know one thing that i um i know from, from my parents if you wanted to buy a beer you would often have to wait around three hours so next time you go buy a beer <laughs> maybe think about that <laughs> in perspective yeah I don't know if it was always like this, but yeah, this is just one, one funny story I thought to share with you. Yeah, for German people, that would be the worst case. Yeah, right? <laughs> Queuing for yeah. hours for a beer, worst case for Germans. <laughs> yeah. Also, it was very cold. People didn't have a lot of heating. Um, they had limited hot water. They were allowed to watch two hours. I, I mean, it was only possible actually to watch two hours of TV a day. And even that were, you know, the messages from Ceausescu and, you know, very censored information. Um, if you had a car, if you're lucky enough to have a car, you would only be allowed to drive that car on alternate days. So you couldn't, you know, drive the car on the first and on the second. You either had just the first, the third, the fifth, um, or you know, the um, the odd or the even numbers, essentially. And sometimes, you know, I remember from my parents' wedding when they got married, um, it was problematic because all of their friends could only drive a car in the odd days, and they needed a car for the wedding, so they had to find someone who was able to drive their car on an even day. So yeah. Um, abortion, of course, was illegal, and I know this is the case in many countries around the world. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of women were trying to inflict abortions on, on themselves and um, were, were, you know, 
died or you know suffered severe um, trauma because of that. Um, and yeah, the borders were closed, so you were not allowed to go elsewhere. And, and a lot of people, particularly towards the end of the communist period, were trying to escape Romania and hide in trunks of cars and you know find a better chance elsewhere. Um, but yeah, the five punishments were obviously very severe. So, um, and the picture here is a picture of Nicolae Ceausescu, who was making people cheer for him. He, he took once a, a trip to um, North Korea and was very impressed. And then he uh, brought some of the learnings from there back to Romania and uh, started implementing them. All right. Um, Do you know when the communism ended? Yeah, in 89. Okay. So in 1989, um, and this is essentially what happened, um, there was a revolution um, and Romanians stood up against uh, Nicolae Ceausescu um, and demanded um, their freedom and um, Ceausescu was shot. And after that, Romania became a democratic country. And yeah, just briefly around the aftermath, um, obviously the borders opened a lot of you know you were allowed to do all of the things that you can do nowadays in, in, a, in a democratic country um, but also a lot of corruption um, rose essentially um, because um, as soon as the communism fell a lot of the officials or the you know more uh, powerful people tried to, to quickly climb up um, and I'll talk a little bit about corruption in Romania as well. Um, I do also think that, you know, it was circumstantial. It became the land of all possibilities when before you couldn't, you know, own anything. Everything was owned by the state. A lot of new businesses were founded. A lot of new institutions were founded. But even today, Romania lacks certain infrastructure because it, it almost seems like the country was built up in a hurry after that and the economy was built in a hurry and people skipped a few steps and you can still look at, for example in Romania if you look on Google Maps and you zoom out you're gonna, going to see a lot of green and then one highway that is almost finished <laughs> and it's been like that for many 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 years um, and you know a lot of funds were given to finishing it but they ended up in the wrong pockets essentially. Um, yeah, but even now, you know, co communism was something that affected the way people think um, quite a lot. Um, and, you know, even now, most grandmas in, in Romania still collect every plastic bag they get from the supermarket. They have this mentality of scarcity that um, is one of the, let's say, bitter taste, you know, consequences of, a, of the communist period. All right, so um, in 2000, between, I just thought this would be a nice statistic to share. So between 2014 and 2016, um, over 2000 officials were convicted for abuse of power. So, you know, slowly, slowly, you know, there was a lot of corruption and continues to be quite, you know, a lot of corruption compared to other European countries. Um, but we started to take measures against that. We had a new president, actually one of, um, that, that has also German roots, Klaus Johannes. Um, and he started to look at cleaning up. People start, uh, the, you know, the, um, you know, par parliament and officials and ministers and, and all of that. Um, then, however, in 2017, the ruling coalition, pushed um, an order to decriminalize abuse in, in, the, in the office by officials. Um, and the parliament didn't really get to say anything against it. Uh, so what happened then is that um, th this would allow a lot of the officials that were previously incarcerated to be free again, and also to stop the investigation around, uh, of many, many other officials. So they were trying to decriminalize corruption in a sense, and they wanted to push a rule that if you stole, right? So, or if you, um, yeah, if you stole less than $50,000, then that's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> so 
so they tried to push this this would have freed a lot of already you know locked up um officials and prevented uh, prevented others to go in, in prison and you know this is something that they were able to bring proof so someone who against whom you have proof that they stole fifty thousand um dollars might have stolen a lot more than that but that's what he found proof for essentially right so it was a, a very very um yeah unacceptable move especially for a democratic country in you know 2017 at the time um after that you know in total over the next period of time um over 600,000 people protested then on the right you have um a picture of romanian people standing up and they you know they went every day um with you know um messages and they protested quietly against um the corruption as a, and as a result um uh, the decree was stopped and the minister of justice resigned and also the leader of the governing party was in prison so that doesn't mean you know things are perfect now there's still a lot of things that need to be improved um but it was a uh, quite an emotional experience as well how romania stood up against corruption and how they i mean they didn't really manage to fix everything but you know this decree was um uh, was stopped we also have one question when we go back a little bit to the communism um, time mm -hmm. is there any story based on your parents um yet yeah experience what was the hardest part like um that uh that you had no um rights to to tell your own opinions or queuing feud or something else is there anything you can remember what your parents told you i mean there were many things i think it was generally the the most toxic thing was the lack of trust in others i think so if you would see even now you feel this very very strongly in romania if you see a policeman you think oh it's trouble i need to get away essentially whereas in germany if you see a policeman you trust that person essentially right so you in romania most jokes most jokes in romania are about policemen and unfortunately blondes right so these are the the two most common things whereas in germany it's not really the case yeah so i, I think this this was one thing and um um i mean people adapted right so they had friends they they weren't allowed to do things but they had part tea parties at home and danced and you know um they still had all of the aspects of life that people normally have they were just very they always had to look around the shoulder to to, to look you know to look back and to make sure nobody is listening that you don't say something improper that um you know they i think they were also not a not exposed to so many things right so for example in many other countries of the world we're exposed to different cultures and different races and different religious uh, but because romania was a bubble at the time we saw none of that and i think we feel that more now when the borders are open you know now we start to see more diversity a little bit you know growingly but still i think it's one of the aftermath uh, of of communism that we haven't been exposed to as many diverse stories um and then you know one story i remember from my parents is um if you had good contacts you know if you knew someone you would able to get like a banana or something like that and then it was really green and i remember they were telling me they had to store it in newspaper on top of the closet and keep it there for god knows how long um until they were able to eat it um or you know they would have a book and that book would be circulated between all their friends circles as soon as one person finished with it because you know it was something rare to get your hands on so i think these were most of the stories that i heard but my parents were very young then so um i mean they were kind of my age now still you know they, they grew up in communism um but i think this is what bothered them the most yeah. yeah and we just had a comment i have heard that uh yeah german people can be uh apprehensive of authority and police so in my case i don't think it's really uh apprehensive it's more like uh, we respect their job and we trust them so 
when I see now the pictures in US, I, I'm just scared that this will happen to our police men or police women because um, in my case, I'm not afraid of them. I see them more like, yeah, being in charge of our orders and um, normally or in most cases they are helpful. I have no idea how you see it. So I never had troubles with police, never ever. Yeah, I don't think, in, I, I also haven't had here, in, in Romania, yes, but here, no. Um, I think they're not invasive. You know, I think that's a word to describe it. So if you see them, they're, it's kind of a very subtle presence. It's not, they don't make a, you know, a statement. They don't, they're not aggressive in any ways, or I haven't experienced that here in Germany. Yeah. But in Romania, yes, of course, yeah. All right. So this is another sensitive topic that I want to bring up. And I mentioned before, so we call them uh, Roma people in, in Romania. Um, they're also called Romani or gypsies. Um, and I just quickly wanted to address that. So it's not the same as Romanian. Um, it is a minority group that is found around the world, but you know, a, a large amount of them are based in Romania. Um, they have their own language, they have their own cultures, they live usually very segregated in society. And I just wanted to share with you um, kind of two opposing parts of that. On the right, we have, you know, opulence. We have one of their leaders, they, they usually built this really big houses plated with gold and that look like, you know, palaces, uh, you know, an opulence of money and, you know, exaggeration. Um, and then on the left, especially in the lower corners here, you have how other um, Roma people live, you know, in secluded groups with no access to water or education or, you know, anything else in really bad conditions. Um, I mean, it is unfair to talk about a group and generalize too much, right? So you do have Roma people who are doctors and you do have Roma people who kind of overcome the place and the conditions that they're born into if it is a situation like these poor kids here uh, and build a life of their own, just like you have everywhere else. Um, but I think they usually a lot stick together and they have very little access to, to education. Um, and, you know, they, the, let's say the discrimination and the stigma that is against them in Romania and abroad is primarily around stealing, around prostitution, around uh, violence, you know, and other topics like this. Of, of course, you know, it's unfair to generalize. Um, but it is known that they have very few chances that they, they grow up without education. Um, a lot of them never learn how to read or write. Um, you know, they cannot send text messages, for example. They cannot do all of those things that to us are second nature. Yeah. So unfortunately, until today, it is a big uh, problem everywhere in Romania and, and abroad. And I mean, for us, a lot of the times when I say I'm from Romania, this is one of the first things that people say back to me, oh, gypsies, oh, yeah, they steal, they do this and this and that. And yeah, unfortunately, they, some of them do, uh, some of them don't, but it's, you know, a minority group. And with that, the situation is never black or white. It's usually quite gray. It comes down to the opportunities they get to, the, the way they're segregated and stigmatized. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very sad, but it's still until today the case. <clears throat> yeah, I just uh, um, saw yesterday a nice newsletter, a newspaper article about yeah, an old couple in Germany and they got new neighbors. Yeah, like um, how you say, like um, gypsies, is it gypsies? And yeah. before they they said, oh my God, we don't want to have them. But then they realized their situation. They're just loud because yeah, the kids have no toys. So they, they um, yeah, 
because um, they had some washing lines on the balcony and um, the water was just dropping down on their balcony. But yes, of course, there was no washing, no proper washing machine, no dryer. So, and then they just realized it's not that they are, they are behaving bad, it's their situation. Yeah, and I, I think it's also culture and, you know, a lot of the traditions and they're uh, not everyone again, but a lot of them grow up in this situation where they don't see other things. They don't have an example that you shouldn't, I don't know, throw, for example, leave trash behind. It's something so simple and it's easy to judge that they do it. But, you know, nobody taught them better. Nobody ever told them, hey, it's not nice. There's the garbage there. Can you pick it up and, you know, take the trash to the garbage? Unfortunately, they were not exposed to these examples. And then, you know, wh when is it fair to make that judgment and when not? I, I mean, again, it's a delicate topic. It's, you know, we can debate over this and discuss it at length. But, um, yeah, it is, we can't blame it on them just for being, you know, from this minority group. Yeah. And now I'll shift to more positive topics. Um, and I've selected a few pictures that I think show you the culture and the tradition, culture and traditional Romania, right? It's our fol uh, folk clothing and traditional national costumes. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we love celebrations and we love, you know, music and dinners and, you know, every time you go to a festivity dinner for Easter, for Christmas, or, you know, very often just for someone's birthday or name day, there will be so much food that you need to eat it for hours and take a nap and then continue eating again and, you know, keep sipping Tsuika in between. But uh, yeah, we, we love doing everything in style. We have a lot of slow cooked food as well often you know on the uh, in the oven or in more rural areas on this ceramic I don't know exactly how it's called in English but it's the ceramic heater where you make fire like a yeah like a fire place yeah that keeps the house warm when you don't have central heating essentially and they cook it there um, and a lot of uh, jarred food so you would take the vegetables that you produce in your garden during summer and autumn and then to pickle pickle things or prepare different salads and preserved foods that you would eat over winter um, and everything is around the community so you know the mother and the daughter and the sister and the cousin the the women of the family would get together and would prepare all of these feasts um, way in advance for for every celebration or even for you know sadder moments in life when you do remembrance, uh, you know di dinners. Uh, yeah, and then this year um, uh, in the lower corner are women also in national outfits that are um, hand painting eggs, and we do that for Easter um, as well. I think now younger people less and less, but still in rural areas, this is something that people do. So they would. Um, take the Easter eggs and then they would empty um, the contained. Yeah, they would make a small hole and empty it. Uh, and then they would hand paint it and it's almost like pieces of art that uh, they're very, you know, slowly and carefully made. Same in Germany. Really? Okay, I didn't yeah, know that. That's Germany, yeah. It's uh -huh. biggest yeah. thing for kids for Eastern and uh, they really enjoy it and uh, yeah. And the it's cold in Romania, right? In winter? Um, it's in winter, yeah. really cold. So we have very hot summers and we have four seasons essentially. The summer is really hot. It can, depending on the area, it can go up to 40 degrees. And then the winters uh, get quite cold. So you can have in the mountains, of course, minus 20 degrees. But in Bucharest, um, around zero minus five minus ten something like this is the the lowest i mean you would have exceptions but on average this is kind of it yeah yeah and these are also some traditional um customs around christmas with carolings where people dress in sh sheep um, skin like sheep um, fur coats um and they go around and make a lot of noise and they carol and you give them money
And I also wanted to share with you some, some bits and pieces from rural Romania. So until today, most of Romania is still in the rural area. And I think, you know, as you travel and you see cities and capitals, they all have, you know, access to infrastructure and education and jobs. And you, you would have one of these big corporations there at least, right? So life is not that different. You have cafes, you have the first sushi place and the first Vietnamese restaurant and all of that, right? So it, it's becoming more and more global. But if you go to rural Romania, and if you ever go to Romania, I strongly recommend that you do that. That's where you find culture and tradition and the unexpected. Um, like in most rural areas, rural Romania is very seasonal. So depending on when you go, you would have a completely different experience. Um, you know, people still, I think this is one of the other, let's say, um, consequences of communism. The land and everything was split after that between people. So most people would have, you know, a house and a little bit of, piece of land uh, where they grow cereals and, you know, these plum trees for, for this liquor they make, et cetera, et cetera. So um, because of that, although we have a lot of land that would potentially be very good for crops. So we, we have in Europe, I think the fourth largest potential for agriculture because we have a lot of good land and it would be, you know, it, it could have a lot of yield in, in, in agriculture, but because of the, that the land is so fragmented and everyone has this little piece, you can't do it efficiently, right? So you can't put a machine and do everything, right? So everyone has their own little piece, which is why until today, Romania remains largely, you know, around manual labor. So they don't have that many trucks to do things, but everyone kind of still, you know, um, with a with a shovel and their tools do everything manually or most of it this is a very very the second picture up here is a very traditional picture from romania and i so i'm from bucharest born and raised but i would spend my summers at the house we have at the countryside and you know i traveled like that as well there you would see someone who's like, hey, where are you going? And then they would say, oh, I'm going to the center because of course, you know, there's one center in that village and that's it. And they have one shop and one bread shop and then one, you know, place where you go drink and that's about it. Um, what was the name of the city or the area? Because there was also um, one question, what uh, area specific uh, area would you recommend for a rural Romania? Is that something? Uh -huh. Ooh, well, I think you'd have very different experiences wherever you go. I think the area that I grew up in would be less interesting, but there are, um, I have to think about it. Maybe we can send an email after. Yeah, we will send an email afterwards. So yeah. maybe we can collect all these questions. Feel free to use the chat yeah. and we will collect them and send an email. Yeah, to I'll think about it because every, uh, still remaining is very different. If you go in the north or in the east, you'd have a very different experience than in other areas. So. It also depends how long you have. If you have, for example, I don't know, a long weekend, you're going to go probably to Transylvania, but you can still find rural places there. Like there are some villages in the area that you can go visit. So not just the city. Um, yeah, so we have some beautiful hand-painted churches because in Romania, as Romania was being built, we had different leaders and it was very fragmented. And whenever one of these leaders would win a battle, they would build a church. Um, so we have a gazillion churches now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So agriculture, I told you about the ways of transportation I told you about, and this on the left here is a fun little thing that people in rural areas do not everywhere. And I think not as much nowadays, but, uh, I think on a, one specific day of spring, they, they throw water on the women so that they flourish. <laughs> I think if you're a woman, you, I think it initially started as a custom where they would have to perfume them, but then again, you know, that spiral spiraled into what, you know, watering them at the end. Anyway. Um, and now just because I want to leave a, at least a couple of minutes for you guys to give questions or anything. Um, I wanted to show you some images from Romania. You can find a lot more online. I think it's, it has a lot of 
und untapped potential and undiscovered places, a lot of caves. We have the biggest saline, saline, I think you call it. So a salt mine underneath where you even have like a theme park in it. And it looks a little bit like uh, from, you know, what are these medieval movies or something? Yeah. So we have a lot of beautiful nature, a lot of hiking. So remember the center of the country is formed of mountains. So you have very beautiful hiking trails, still unexplored, still not as touristic. So yeah, I think it's a really beautiful place to, to visit still because it doesn't have as much tourism as other countries. Um, this is a very nice waterfall. We have a bunch of them. Uh, we have a lot of lakes, glacier lakes as well. And this here is the Danube, so the big river in the south that I mentioned. Um, and this um, statue is of, before, so many, 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 many years ago, before the Romans conquered Romania, this was uh, um, called Decebal and he was r the, ruler, the ru ruler of this area. Um, and you can take boat trips and this essentially is the southern border, border of Romania. You also have very beautiful um, canyons that you can explore with beautiful nature and flowers and rivers. Yeah. Now this is a weird little place. Um, it's this mysterious forest that is supposed to be haunted. So uh, they, they say there are all sorts of paranormal activities going on there. I mean, I personally don't believe in that, but I still think it would be kind of cool to visit that. So feel free if you're, if you're interested in this sort of thing um, to visit it. There are many beautiful places around Romania we also, that I haven't included here. One of them is we have mud volcanoes that look really cool. So it looks very lunar. You have this beautiful um, view um, of mud volcanoes. We also have um, the living fire, so it comes from the earth and it never goes off, even if it's snow, even if it's rain, it's just constantly burning in, in different places, so you can visit that too. But I think the mountains are one of the most beautiful places. Is, uh, is the forest uh, at a specific place? Is it a specific, uh, because uh, Feliz? Person. Yeah, if mm -hmm. you ask, is it a, a specific place or a specific uh, forest or? Yeah, so this is called Bachu Forest. I, I actually have the name here, you see, B-A-C-I-U-L. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I-U, sorry, with that deal. Yeah, so you can Google it. Um, but I, I would say depending on how you plan your trip to Romania and how long you have, keep in mind that it takes a while to get from place to place, right? We have only one high, highway. Uh, it takes a while to travel, um, but yeah, it could be a cool place to visit, I think. There are many, many other beautiful places and forests. And then uh, two other nice ones. So on the left, we have the Tunnel of Love. It's an abandoned trail that where the, the trees kind of grew in this you know beautiful format. And I think it's quite nice if you go beginning of autumn when they start to change color or in summer like here. Um, and on the right, we have another odd little place called the Happy Cemetery. Um, so all the crosses where they bury people look like this. And um, instead of being a place of mourning, it's a place where on the, on the memorial stones, they write jokes or fun, funny anecdotes. So in, in an attempt to remember people in a positive way. Uh, and you have also some, you know, famous Romanian writers and authors that are based there, uh, th that are uh, buried there. All right, and then uh, on the left, so I mentioned hiking, so many beautiful mountains and hiking trails in Romania. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's, you know, like you hike for a while, you sleep somewhere, then you continue hiking and then you get to this place. And I think it has, I don't remember exactly, but maybe like 12 kilometers, I could be wrong, but essentially you can walk, like there's nothing to the right, nothing to the rest, to the left, you're quite at high altitude, then you can walk on this very thin strip for a number of kilometers. Unfortunately, I don't remember how many, I might be wrong, but it was quite a long <laughs> walk. I, I don't think we didn't do all of it, but you can do parts of it. And then on the right, you have um, 
this um, it's called Transvagarashan, this very sinuous kind of uh, path that people apparently love. I, I get car sick, so I this looks like a nightmare to me, but a lot of people get excited about it. So here you go. Uh, yeah. And then just in closing, I thought instead of teaching you a few simple words like hello and goodbye, to share with you some funny Romanian sayings that my friends always laugh about when I, when I say so. On the left, um, we have a venit cu mâna în fund, which literally translated means um, that someone came with uh, his arm in his butt or with his palm between his butt. I, I think my translation was better. So someone came with the hand in their butt, essentially. And that means that they didn't bring a gift when they came to visit you. And then on the right, we have ka baba mitraliera, which means like an old lady with a machine gun. And you would say this when, you know, it's unfitting or unsuiting. So I would say, for example, um, these people fit together like an old lady with a machine gun. So they don't essentially, or, you know, or you're here, they explain also, you could use it as unsuitable for the job at hand. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yes, yeah, that's- so much. Uh, yeah, thank you, first of all. But we have another question. Um, so there's uh, Morgan from the States and she was, she, 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 Morgan's she, right? She was uh, wondering, uh, is it common for people uh, to study, work or live abroad uh, like you do? Or how is it? Do you well, have a lot I, of, yeah. I think that's a very good question, actually. I'm glad you asked that because I was thinking if to add this, but I didn't want to make the presentation too long. So I'm glad you asked. Um, yes, it's common for people to leave Romania more and more. And actually quite a large number of educated young people go move abroad. Um, either, you know, they usually go for studying and then they leave, they, they stay there or they, um, study in Romania and then they go to find a better job. So I think on average in Romania, still the, the salaries are lower than other, than most countries in, in the, in Europe. Um, and you know, there are still relatively few job opportunities for young people. I mean, you, you can find, of course, a job. You can do something anywhere if you want to, but it is, um, there is a tendency of young people, young, educated, qualified people to live, uh, who, who leave Romania, not only to study abroad, but also to live abroad. Yeah. Okay. Um, Girl Gone International was one on the first page. Did you start that group? So... I don't really get the question. Do you get it? Uh, which one, sir, again? Uh, from Carla, Girl Gone International was one was on the first page. Did you start that group? Yeah, I get the question. I have no idea what no, it is. There, there is a group called Girl Gone International. No, I unfortunately didn't start the group, um, but I know about it. Um, I, but I think right now already it became kind of a an expression, um, I guess. I also liked how it sounded, so I thought it represents me and I would put it there. Now, I didn't start a group, um, but I think there are many girls who've gone international uh, around the world. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I lived three years in Hong Kong and uh, I also yeah lived abroad, but uh, yeah. So there's Usas, Usastan and Ezos Bosk. <laughs> Bosk, yes. Mm. Wait, I forgot what Asustan means. I have to Google it. Okay. So, yeah, but uh, before you Google it, I just want to say thank you so much for yeah your personal experience, uh, your presentation. And uh, I learned a lot. Uh, so I definitely want to travel to Romania because, to be honest, it's still on my bucket list. But uh, yeah, you convinced me. <laughs> Good. Uh, Feliz Dia Mama, I just saw now. Uh, I guess that's not your name, but um, yeah, they say that the forests are have paranormal acti- um, activities going on, that it's something very mysterious about it. I'm not really scared about it because I don't believe in it, but I don't know. 
uh, you, you might be. So if you are, maybe don't go there. <laughs> yeah. And how can people contact you? What's the best way to contact you? Um, so is it Instagram? Is it LinkedIn? I maybe we can it. share it in I, our newsletter. Maybe we will send a little summary. So yeah, we can, I mean, you have my LinkedIn already, uh, Nadine, but I can give you my Instagram too, so people can just stay in touch. Don't feel uh, uh, obligated to follow me or anything, you know, LinkedIn is fine too. So, but yeah, if you have any questions, just uh, reach out to me. That's fine. Yeah. Perfect. Thank right. you so much. What is it in Romania to say thank you? Uh, you have two ways. You have the long way, which is mulțumesc, which I think you might struggle with a bit. Can you try it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, let's let's skip this part. The next one. <laughs> the next one you can do for sure, because it's just like in French. We say merci, but we, we roll the eyes a little bit, so it's not like merci. Yeah, exactly. Merci. Thank you, Maria. It was... A pleasure to have you. Next week, we are traveling to many different parts because we have Vinny uh, in our yeah, little travel series and he lived abroad in many countries. So he's original from Brazil, moved to uh, Hong Kong. He is now in London, but he I have no idea in how many uh, countries he lived. So uh, hope to see you next week. Please stay all mm -hmm. healthy and we will definitely summarize uh, a few places and the contact to Maria uh, in a newsletter and uh, have a nice day, a nice evening, afternoon and see you soon. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.